you've got the same issues that you have in the real world, right? People have agendas and then they can easily convince themselves and also appear very charismatic. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. How much can you trust your colleagues? How much do you trust that someone has your back and not feeding misinformation, like taking credit for your work? How much do you feel you can speak up when there's a problem and are respected for that, not thrown under the bus, limiting your career growth? The research is clear that high-trust environments perform better. Competing views are respected, debated, and generate better outcomes. But the fact is, so many places are not trusting or safe environments. Bad behavior, unfortunately, in many organizations is rewarded. How can we detect and manage bad behavior? How do we create environments that prevent what my guest today calls bad actors? Today, I'm excited to discuss this topic with an expert, Jacob Kuczynski, who has worked in trust and safety at the world's top internet companies. He's got depth and breadth. Over the past decade, Jacob has worked and driven initiatives in trust and safety at Google, ByteDance, for those who aren't familiar, that's the Chinese company that runs TikTok, and Meta, formerly Facebook. Jacob has worked on, you name it, blogger abuse, harassment, child safety, extremism, misinformation, managing that balance between free speech and reckless behavior, particularly when content is user-generated. So thinking about scalable enforcement, the use of technology, and building strong partnerships to manage that. Prior to moving to Silicon Valley, where he resides, he spent a decade in technology and management at Procter & Gamble. Jacob hails from Poland and holds multiple advanced degrees in information technology and business administration from Gdansk University of Technology and Kozminski University in Poland. He's also completed executive education in the Bay Area, covering both Stanford and Berkeley. Excited to talk about his fascinating career path that's taken him to leading trust and safety and to get us thinking about what we can learn from a trust and safety expert that can be applied to our careers and leadership. Jacob, welcome to 97% Effective. Thanks, Michael. Nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes. And first, I want to say my teenage daughter sometimes asks over lunch who is coming on the show. <laughs> and I'll be perfectly blunt with you. Usually her eyes gloss over when I share bios. But today, I only had to say two words, TikTok and Instagram. And she clearly clicked. <laughs> so I want to thank you for fostering that family <laughs> moment. And even ask you, like, what in your global background or employers do your kids find cool about you? Uh, it's a fun question. When my kids learned and and then they told their friends that I'm, I'm going to be joining TikTok from Google, you could see the glow. I mean, and any swag that I was getting from, from TikTok was immediately gone. Like they were just ripping it apart and then bragging about to their friends, taking it to school. Like TikTok and the, the brand recognition that it built in, in that demographic is just amazing. It's the virality, it's the creativity. That's where, that's where stuff happens. So really, really young people really build that association, strong association with the brand, trust it, and well, spend time on it too. And when you moved over to Meta, did you get kind of the same response from them? 
Not really. <laughs> okay, yes. I mentioned Facebook and like, what is Facebook? But Instagram obviously is still kind of... Instagram, obviously, but it kind of resides in Young's mind as a separate brand. Mm -hmm. What helped me when I moved to, to Meta was that I, I bought the Meta products. I bought the VR headset mm -hmm. and I bought the Ray-Ban glasses and I showed them to the kids showing what the teams are, are capable there and how they're building the Metaverse in that direction. That got them excited. Mm -hmm but not to the same way that, that TikTok lives in their heart. <laughs> Help connect the dots for us here. How does one go from growing up in communist Poland behind the wall to ending up an expert in trust and safety at, at I mean, I'm going to argue here, three of the most dominant tech companies in the world. Connect that for us. Looking back, I think it's multiple things. On the high level, I would describe it as you you take the opportunities that present themselves in front of you and then you try them and then you also create more opportunities as you build the momentum and as you build the capabilities, experience, and also trust in yourself that you're going to do well, even though something might seem scary. There's nobody in your, your, in your close network or family or relatives that, that can actually advise you on this. You have to try it or seek out mentorship from, from people um, that have been through it, right? Like you build that network. Originally, I didn't have it. What, what happened to Poland and Europe in more broadly, Eastern Europe and Central Europe is, is quite a miracle of, of democracy and enablement and opportunity creation for people. So maybe that's the lucky element that I, I, I got to live through that and, and then seize that opportunity and capitalize on it, meaning, you know, get a formal education, get English as my secondary language. Previously, almost impossible behind the, the wall. And then foreign companies, P&G came, right? So I, I knew I want to study something engineering. Computer science has been on the top of my list. So when I joined Procter & Gamble, the company also had a very smart way of engaging the, the people and sending them, the current employees that were coming from particular universities, they were sending them as ambassadors to talk about the company to the, to the students. And that's how I got to learn about, about P&G. My friends were working there and they were creating something big. They were hiring hundreds of people building um, IT capabilities in Central Europe. So I got to be part of that for 10 years. And next, it's, it's really also trusting and building a mentorship network. So I, I had multiple really great managers in P&G. P&G is a company that famously builds people and builds great, great leaders. So I trusted them and also were learning to be very outspoken about my career aspirations. I've kind of always been a leader. I've, I've been the president of my years at, at all the schools that I've attended. And I, was, I, I learned very fast that if you're not advocating for yourself, you're going to be left behind. Like I was left behind in my initial three years and wasn't promoted in, in, in PNG. That was like learning number one for Cuba. Mm -hmm. You have to advocate for yourself and you have to build then people who will want to spend the time to build you up and give you more responsibilities. And so I, I quickly built this around me as a strong a bench of, of mentors and leaders who care for me in my development. And then I trusted their gut also selecting internal assignments that grow me. So within the 10 years, I, I got to run the hosting operations business for, for PNG, which means I was running everything that PNG has on the internet, all of the websites. And, and of course, then you deal with a lot of abuse uh, because anything you put on the internet, uh, you, you know, like people were trying to take those websites down and attacking them or uploading inappropriate content and whenever we were running contests. So I started specializing in going to conferences um, and specializing in abuse detection and then prevention. And then Google, as a big company, was always on these conferences. So I met a bunch of great, great people there. And maybe this is a tip number one that sort of, if I think about it right now, is like when you, when you meet people, like I used LinkedIn and, and maintaining my network in LinkedIn. I added those people. I always followed up and I built a, a large uh, uh, set of really high specialists mm -hmm. in, my, in my network that were dealing with these problems. So sooner or later, uh, a recruiter from Google reached out um, and they've been tipped by one of the people that I've interacted with at one of these conferences. And I was being recruited for a, a senior management position in Dublin to establish a trust and safety sub-team uh, division there as trust and safety was becoming a big thing. And yeah, again, I knew nobody that made these moves. I knew those people in Google, but they were not my close friends. So I still decided to take that, open that door and 
just go for it, knowing that I will, I'll figure it out. Similar move to, to California. One of my mentors from Google offered me saying, Kuba, you're great. Uh, I, I have this problem. I think you're the best person to you to capitalize on your PNG background, but also on the trust and safety background, and actually to run a bigger team and establish it from, from scratch here in the Bay Area. So I, I decided to, to, to take that opportunity as well, knowing well that it's going to be a bigger change than moving within Europe. Similar change happened by my network recruiting me uh, for the TikTok job and very similarly to Meta. Uh, but I made sure, again, to build that network. And then as you do this and as you, as you build that track record and momentum, make sure to build people around you and just take care of those relationships. And those relationships later on, like that, that village that you will create will be your village that you can lean upon. And then they will also call up on you when, when new opportunities arise. There's so many elements there <laughs> that have appeared on this show, but you've captured them so well there in your story. And, and I didn't know that part about your story that you were dealing with abuse online at PNG. To talk about trust and safety, and, and just to provide a little bit of context, you, you've described in, in previous talks that trust and safety is about fighting bad actors. That, that's a very simple visual. Yeah. What is it, the mandate, at least trust and safety in the roles that you had at a, at a tech social media company? Sure. I would describe it as, I mean, it's captured in the name. It's really about building trust, trustworthy and safe environment for the users. So that's like the, the, the highest level. If you go and like un start unpacking that mission, you can think about specifically for, for companies that deal with user-generated content. So, you know, people that are either posting something, be it text, videos, photos, or are engaging with that content, meaning are commenting under it, are liking it, are downranking it by saying, no, I don't like this. And by extension, also other forms of engagement. Like I can report you uh, to the company saying, I don't like your video. What you're trying to do when you're in the when you're building a trust and safety department is you're trying to make sure that the environment in which the users will engage with your product will be, will be good for them, will be something that they have a, a, a fond association with. So the, the brand perception and the trustworthiness of your brand remains high. They, and then by extension, if you look at the different forms of what makes these users feel like they, they, they're not trusting your brand, you start then delineating the different abuse areas um, so things like, I don't want to be harassed on the, on the product. I don't want to experience bullying. I, I don't want to see pornography. And when you, when you try to take the full vast array of things and then delineate them, you're typically ending up with between 12 to 20 like big ticket items that you need to write rules of what your platform is allowing and not allowing. I always describe trust and safety structure as a triangle. So at the top of the triangle is the policies or community guidelines or basically those rules of within a particular issue vertical, so say pornography or violent extremism. These are the things that we don't allow. These are the things that are okay. Then you need to take that and hire the right people, typically a group of product managers, analysts, and just create like the middle section of the triangle, which is, all right, now that we know what we want and what we don't want, I need to scalably implement this within, within my products. I need to find the people as well as find the content that is not okay with those policies and then remove it. I sometimes did the calculation uh, for, for my teams. There's not enough people in the world, like 8 billion plus people in the world will not be enough to be hired by YouTube to review all of the videos that, that are being uploaded. So you can, you can sense that the level of scale. And at the bottom of the triangle, bottom or foundation is a better way to describe it, you need to hire a lot of people, which we often refer to in the industry uh, as moderators or, or community guidelines operators or labelers. Those are the people that typically are uh, tasked with the binary decision making and labeling something as good, bad, uh, you know, falls within the policy, falls, falls outside of the policy. And you need to hire hundreds, tens of thousands for the big platforms, and you hire them across the world because they have local context and they have local language expertise and they are typically reviewing and labeling the data that then is used by the middle of the triangle people to make scalable enforcement decisions and create that trustworthy environment for users of the platform. I didn't realize there are 
physically people out there who are parsing and saying good or bad according to the, the, the policy? Oh, it's a huge business. It's a huge business. I would say the biggest ones have like a million people working wow. in, in that space for all of the platforms. And it's not only the big platforms, but smaller platforms are, are using these services as well. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. And so you've talked about kind of this definition of, of good, which obviously the opposite is bad. And that sounds like it's very much the, the organization sitting down and deciding what that is that sets the rules yes. at the top of the pyramid that go down. And this is a very interesting point that, you, that you're bringing up. They have to thread the policy uh, at the top of the triangle, right? Like, what do we allow and not allow? Not only has it, to, has, it has to be enforceable, but typically it's well-researched as well as experience of, of trying to write policies for these platforms. They amend it over time, also with changing uh, circumstances in, in the world. I can quote an example. COVID misinformation, when COVID hit, Initially, it, it, it was quite a blanket, like anything you talk about COVID, we will take it down because we, we, we just don't have verifiable sources of information as to, the, for instance, the origin of the virus. So we don't want to allow, like most of the platforms did not want to allow speculation that, you know, this, this virus came from China and then some form of racism and real world harm happening to, towards Chinese people. So they were, they were taking a quite a blanket stance because... No data was, was available. And over time, this got perfected and certain level of constructive discourse was allowed and that bar was lowered. Mm -hmm. Again, constructive typically discourse that doesn't venture into hate, hateful comments or harassing comments. Not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it puts a lot of power and decision making in that top yes. of the triangle. So we're talking about a couple companies here that really yeah. can influence what is being said and what can't. In certain governments, right? The obvious example here I've been thinking is is with China. Yeah, it you know can be taken as another form of censorship. These things will not appear down in the in the triangle. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that because that I think that's a, it's a deeper topic. I, I do want to ask this question because it comes up a lot in in coaching and working with executives, and and even on this show I've had individuals say, "Oh, you can tell when someone's lying. Very easy to detect." But the research here, I would argue, kind of counters that and to say it is very easy to deceive people. This is why we get hucksters, fraudsters, Ponzi schemes. So I just want to ask you, is it easy to detect misinformation or bad actors? Not at all. I think that mirrors the real world to, to a large degree. I'll tell you how the platforms are dealing with this. But in broad strokes, you've got the same issues that you have in the real world, right? People have agendas and then they can easily convince themselves and also appear very charismatic in, into saying something. The way platforms deal with this is, is they really try to write the policies with user harm in mind and then draw the line of what's allowed and, and not allowed when whatever is being done, said, posted on the platform is venturing into user harm. Like users are reporting that they are more stressed, more worried, all the way down to like they're physically maybe abused or, or sometimes even it could lead to consequences as people dying uh, in, in real life, right? And you try to toe the line sometimes with, with extraordinary circumstances in mind, right? I'm thinking about President uh, Trump back back before he was deplatformed by by all the major platforms YouTube, Meta, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter back then before it was X, and the platforms were making a decision like well it's a, it's an elected official so even if they say things that are incredibly wrong and potentially de are are deceiving the society it's an elected official so people should judge by themselves so we we're erring on the side of giving them voice because of the the particular office that they that they are in. But when it ventured into the January 6th insurrection in, in the Capitol, that's where like it crossed the line into something that's visibly having a real bad impact in the world, which in turn created the foundation of why he was deplatformed. When you look at trust and safety, and you've touched on pieces of this, what are some of the kind of most common areas or, or, or strategies that bad actors are using? to achieve their goals? Mostly, if you look at, if you take 
a data-based approach and you take any platform and you take a snapshot of quote-unquote all of the badness understood as everything that's, that's basically against the policies uh, that, that are laid out. So against the things that we believe in should be or shouldn't be uh, on the platform. Most of it is going to be spam or, or like variations of, 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 of spam, like um, low impact from, from a user perspective, but, but like high volume mm. things, right? Think Gmail uh, as an example. Um, most that the Gmail trust and safety teams do is they make sure that they, they stop this, this massive amount of spam that is trying to be sent to your, to your inbox. And then there's a second grouping of, of offenses or violators or bad actors that are doing a low frequency but high impact type of harm. Uh, so more convoluted types of spam uh, where they're trying to basically log into your account and then try to take over your account credentials and then spam your, your, your close relatives asking them for money, for instance, right? You cannot do this in, in mass like you do with, with just email spam, but it, it requires time and, and a high level of investment, but the payout is bigger. Most of the bad actors are financially motivated. Like that's, that's why they do it. They want you to click something. They want you to buy something. They want you to see a particular ad because there's a certain conversion rate that you will buy a certain product. But there's also other motivations. Governments, uh, certain adversary, adversary governments to other countries are, you know, using uh, fraud and also using the platforms to sow discontent or, or create doubt and undermine democratic processes. More broadly, 99% is, is really little spammers trying to make a buck. Mm -hmm. And then you have these other very low frequency, but a super harmful behaviors that, that are happening on the platforms. And you describe that triangle, which sounds like the process company set up to begin. Is there another yeah. framework that companies go through? Yeah. And over time, like initially when the first team in Google was created to really fight pornography, it started with just identifying simple problems and then devising solutions and then keeping them current. But then more and more, it's, it's really trust and safety is often described as a cat and mouse game. Mm. When you make certain vectors of attack impossible or too costly for, for the bad actors, they will then try to work around them or find different ways to get in and, and get that outcome that they're looking for. So over time, the, the middle of the triangle uh, of trust and safety has started expanding and building additional capabilities. I'll start with some of the basics. We started looking at, at incident trends, right? Well, like what's happening? Is there a particular problem that we're seeing that occurs that needs to be plugged? You started buying third-party intelligence. They really specialize, they infiltrate, for instance, black markets of, of account resales or, or even things like violent extremism forums. And they succinctly describe what's happening there. And you can buy this as a service so that you know what kind of new vectors of attack are brewing and might manifest themselves on your platforms. You've created later on, and in TikTok, I built the full threat assessment and quote unquote, a red team, as it's called in the industry, which is a team that spends the time trying to attack your own platform and see what kind of vulnerabilities you can find and then plug them before they become something that's going to be exploited in the wild. Chrome and Google is famous. They organize bug bounty contests where, you know, you're paying people sometimes hundreds of thousands of, of dollars for discovering certain vulnerabilities before they become something that's going to be exploited. On the outside, it seems like, yeah, just, you know, it's a black and white yes and no, but you need to write the right policies. You need to make sure that they're enforceable at scale. And then you need to label the, the hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that, that are coming in. Yeah, as you're talking through that, it just strikes me. Be great of organizations. I'm thinking of HR and leadership out there of being able to take the temperature, right? Is there toxic behavior going on? What would be vectors uh, people are using to create misinformation within companies? Very interesting to think about that. Some curiosity here, user content has is helped a lot of these platforms ex explode and expand and scale. And it, it would seems like there's not a solution in kind of users managing themselves. And this was interesting because a previous guest, we were talking about human nature, right? That we will, you know, or you could have a few bad apples that, that ruin things. So is this kind of negative to say that people can't police themselves or a community can't police itself? I always compare this to real world and think about why we have police in the first place as well. And we have rules. We have, we have organizations that are specifically tasked that we pay 
money from our own incomes to, to maintain, to uphold these rules. If you, if you look what, what's happening, if, if you don't put these people in charge of, of maintaining uh, order, you create lawlessness. And that's how I, I kind of view the mirror in, in online world as a mirror of the, of the real world. And now the, the debate becomes, okay, so who writes these rules and who enforces them? I think Reddit is quite interesting as an example. They, they cracked the way of empowering a group of people, uh, quote unquote moderators, but not in the triangle sense, but more like people that are moderating particular parts of, of Reddit. And they feel connected to, the, to, to making it, you know, with the, within the rules. And they, they do the same things. They demote, they remove, they block certain people from, from accessing that particular part of Reddit. And typically they do it for free because they kind of consider themselves part of that square that they're defending. Right. Like, and the debate has to follow a certain set of rules. But it's, it's very nice from a Reddit perspective that they don't have to, you know, employ these people. They do it because they created this community aspect of it. I think the other the other element, and nobody really has been able to crack it as well as Reddit did, to be honest. Mm. I think Twitch is quite close. Twitch is the uh, video streaming, live streaming platform. They also uh, creators can empower certain people on their on um, uh, when they're live streaming to moderate what's happening in the comments uh, section. Also, typically for free, just for the fact that you've elevated them and now they feel empowered mm. to 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 help you out. And there's an association with the creator as well. So I'm doing something for somebody that I really like and adore. And w Wikipedia is another one, yeah. right? But it's, it's a little bit more convoluted and complicated. But technically, you can, it's like crowdsourcing the truth and doing it in a way that you're technically not paying anybody to, to, to do it. People do it because they feel the sense of, I just want something that has high quality out there. And, and I'm going to spend my time to do this. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely sounds like empowerment ownership. My mind goes to parts of your organization and what creates that productive environment. Jacob, you've given us a solid understanding of how trust and safety departments work. In particular, that the goal is to keep the community safe from harm and that very powerful image of the triangle, the top determining the rules, the middle finding scalable means to detect and deter bad actors, and the wide base enforcing by flagging content. That sets a fantastic foundation for exploring how we might use this information to protect ourselves inside our own organizations, even accelerate our careers. To start that, I wanna ask an odd question. What strategies might we borrow from bad actors to help us? But I leave listeners to ponder what you, Jacob, have to say about that because we have hit time today and we'll continue on our episode next week. Join me next week on 97% Effective as I continue my conversation with Jacob Kochinski, trust and safety expert. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.